we're going to be talking about analyzing ICS vulnerabilities. So next slide, please. Thank you. Um, first, we want to start with the agenda. I'd like to go over our 2019 year in review report. I'm going to discuss some of the key findings that we had and what they mean and kind of how you should be interpreting that data. And then I'll go over our process and how we do our own analysis um, and how we kind of arrive to that data. And then lastly, I want to talk about what you can do with the data in your own environments. Um, next slide, please. All right, so we had a total of 212 ICS vulnerability advisories that we analyzed in 2019. Most of those were ICS cert as a source, but relevant blogs and other sources were also included. The total number of unique vulnerabilities or CVEs um, were in 2019 were 438. And these were, are what we reference when we say a vulnerability. That's one for one, kind of like a CVE. And the total number of vulnerability types uh, were 116. Next slide, please. So first, I just want to dive right into the key findings. 77% of assessed vulnerabilities were considered deep within a control systems network, requiring some existing access to a control systems network to exploit. Um, next slide, please. So this deep within the network statement uh, for all of these devices means we've marked them as either Purdue model three, two, one, or zero. So these could be devices such as Semantic S7, Cipro Tech Relays, ABB Reliance 650s, PLCs, industrial switches, or wireless routers. It could be licensing software like Advantech Diag Anywhere servers, FlexNet Publisher, Plant Connect, or SciTech. If these devices aren't deep within your network and are accessible from enterprise or DMZ or the, you know, even worse, the internet, uh, then you have bigger problems to deal with than vulnerabilities. So several of these devices, just being able to route network packets to them alone is an increased risk. So depending on your maturity model, your network might not be designed or architected in the way that we're saying when we say deep in the network. Um, next slide, please. So 9% of advisories applied to products generally associated with bordering the enterprise, which could facilitate initial access into operations. Next slide, please. So what we mean by that border statement is that these devices were marked as either Purdue model 3.5, 4, or 5. These could be things like semantic endpoint protection, Rockwell Stratix 5950, or remote connect servers. If you can identify some of these choke points of the systems within your environment and then also evaluate risks that may be defined as on the border, uh, potentially anywhere else in your environment, then you can map out where your risks truly are. You can also validate that these are actually on the border of your environment to ensure that your architecture is following the practice that we're talking about here. Um, next slide, please. So 26% of advisories in 2019 had no patch available when the initial advisory came out, presenting a risk or a challenge for users trying to take action on the public, published advisory. So next slide, please. Uh, so this is kind of a goofy diagram, but it's just to show you the vulnerability landscape. And that's kind of all the vulnerabilities to be discovered, but we're only looking at the ICS related ones. So not all possible IT vulnerabilities are in our, our scope, like Windows or Cisco, unless somebody specifically asks us to look at it. So the purple part is really what we're looking at and what we're reporting on. So several vulnerabilities have been found and that would be like the whole orange part. <laughs> Still some haven't been found yet. And the blue is actually what we would be like features of the products themselves. So I've kind of highlighted and carved out a little 26% where the no patch and the purple overlap. And that is the vulnerabilities that we looked at that just had no patch when the time um, the advisory came out. So this means that users and administrators had to figure out some other mitigation beside a patch to reduce these risks. Um, next slide, please. 30% of advisories published incorrect data preventing operators from accurately prioritizing patch management. So for us, this is only counting the advisories that had CVE, CVSS scoring errors. They could be errors that rate the CVSS score higher or lower depending on the vulnerability, but this number does not include technical errors or misrepresentations of what the vulnerability itself does. We actually correct that and we don't track that number. So this is just the CVSS scores that have changes. Um, next slide, please. So I want to just kind of pull a snippet from C2M2, Cybersecurity Capability Maturity Model. Um, this is one of the guidelines for their threat vulnerability management. Um, as someone who's had to implement a vulnerability management program, we're often measured by our ability to respond and mitigate these vulnerabilities, and we rely heavily on the sources that provide us information to act upon. We have goals to identify and respond to threats, to reduce cybersecurity vulnerabilities, and to manage our activities. In a maturity model sense, we're only mature when we have a proper process in place and then we follow that process. 
So we rely on ICS cert and 30% of the ICS cert advisories have incorrect CVSS scores. We're not only making mistakes on how we protect the environment, we're actually measuring our ability to protect the environment incorrectly. Next slide, please. So 40% of advisories applied to uh, engineering workstations and operator station software requiring user interaction or internet connectivity to exploit, which may be rare depending on the industry. Next slide, please. So this kind of brings us back to our Purdue model example of silly diagram. I'm in a quick lesson on zoning. So zones should be separated by firewalls and connections terminated at each zone before traversing into the next one. So this means when your connection traverses through one zone, it should be terminated and reestablished, never crossing more than one at a time. So your engineering workstation, your operator workstation software should not have connectivity to the internet, or at least not directly. It should be filtered through a firewall or proxy before then, keeping in mind that malware could be proxy aware. So your update servers can live inside the DMZ, pulling down any trusted copy instead of having your systems reach directly out into the internet. And engineering workstations don't need to have email or internet access either. They could be secured off and not have that sort of routing capability. So one thing to check, can your equipment in ICS route to places it shouldn't? This can be tested by looking at local routes on the device, firewall or router configs, or if you're feeling saucy, you can do an outbound ping to something else. Something I used to check, um, depending on where, you know, what your default route is, is just setting up a system on the internet that listens on all ports. I use IP tables, and if you want to know how to do that, just reach out to me. I can show you how to do that. Um, and then run a scan from whatever protected device out to that host. Did it get through? Did it get through on any ports that you didn't think of before? Um, you can test this anywhere in your environment. It doesn't have to be on the internet. You could put that host in the DMZ and test, you know, basically any sort of connectivity that you're looking for. If you were doing a PCI test, you could technically do that there too. Um, but if you want to be extra safe, just make sure that the sending devices outbound ping anything like that has no functionality to also get into the process. So that 40% that require user interaction or access to the internet to exploit should have no bearing on you and your environment. If your network is set up in the way that restricts that access, then they've got nothing on you. If your workstations can reach the internet and also into the process, like then you might need to reconsider or redesign um, some of your architecture just to follow best practices. Um, next slide, please. All right, next I wanna go into our Dragos process and how we assess vulnerabilities. I'll go into this a bit further. This is just kind of like the high level part. First, triggered by our sources, you can see in the little diagram, um, we collect whatever information we need um, to understand the vulnerability completely. We answer the three questions and then we prioritize them. All this gets fed into our report and our customers and then um, into the platform as well. Next slide, please. So what are our sources? There's an endless possibility of sources, but Reed, Sam, and I are only human, so we can't do everything. But first, we assess ICS advisories published in ICS CERT, but we also investigate products and assets as requested by our clients. So someone might be asking for us to look at something specifically, and one of them will write it up. Um, while we're also looking at existing vulnerabilities, uh, we'll potentially find more. So um, we also look at any sort of researcher blogs as well as any of our own investigations based off of what we've got in our lab. So Reed's got a lab, I've got a slowly growing lab and a TVN's got one too. So um, just be, please keep in mind that we don't publicly disclose vulnerabilities that we find. We work with the vendors themselves instead. Um, so next slide, please. Here are the three questions. So first we wanna know what is the vulnerability? Then we wanna know why do I care about it? And then we wanna know what can I do about it? To answer these questions are extremely important when trying to convey to others how best to take action. But to answer them, have we gathered all the information we need to know about the vulnerability? Um, next slide, please. First, we kinda of ask ourselves, does it make sense as it's written? We always read the devices, product manuals, anything like that, and we look for clues on how the system is supposed to work. We look for devices on Shodan or anywhere else on the internet to see if anything is exposed or we could pull more information about what ports the devices use, or anything like that. We'll also look up blogs from the researcher and even reach out to the person who found the vulnerability because uh, often actually they respond pretty well and tell you, you know, more about what they've found. So we'll also download the vulnerable software and try to recreate the issue. If it's hardware, we'll try to get a hold of it. Um, like I said before, Reed's lab has a lot of equipment in it, so I usually check there first. Um, I, my collection's growing, but um, basically we'll try to recreate it in our own sense and so that we get a clear picture and understanding of what the vulnerability is, and then we try to prioritize it. Next slide, please. Uh, and we'll kind of talk more about how you can prioritize in your own environment in a second. This is just kind of our process. 
So uh, does the vulnerability actually affect the operator's view of the process? This could be like a denial of service to an HMI. Does it affect the operator's ability to control the process? This could be a denial of service to the controller itself. Uh, is there a safety impact? This could be a vulnerability in the safety in instrumentation. Um, is the CVSS score correct? And based off what we know about the vulnerability, like does the score make sense? We go through the CVSS, I can't say S enough, uh, scoring descriptions and examples to double check that the score matches the vulnerability and when it doesn't, we correct it. Then we ask where in the process does this product or device actually live? And that's when we determine what we think is the uh, best spot in the Purdue model for it to live. Um, and then we ask, like, can a attacker actually leverage this vulnerability, or at least can we monitor it if an attacker tries? And then we check to see if anyone has actually leveraged it elsewhere. Um, this could be looking at the proof of concepts that were already created, often correcting potentially broken ones, uh, checking to see if our activity groups leverage them, and then communicate with our customers um, what's in their environment and what they've seen. Um, next slide, please. So our reports get prioritized with the Drago's threat score, simple color-coded systems, um, and so do our vulnerabilities. And in the vulnerability space, red means patch or mitigate immediately. Yellow is patch, or, or I guess that's orange, but patch or mitigate in the next maintenance cycle. And then green is within a year, kind of whenever um, it works out for you. Next slide, please. Um, so I kind of want to go into a couple examples of our process in a more deep dive. So uh, the first example is the Rockwell Automation Connected Components Workbench. This is associated with ICSA 174701 and CVE 2017-5176. So the source is ICS cert, pretty clear. Um, so what is it? The Connected Components Workbench is a software suite used for commissioning and managing Rockwell PLCs, um, HMIs, safety I.O. modules, um, and other network connected I.O. modules. Uh, so the advisory states that the software contains a local vulnerability known as DLL hijacking. So why do I care? <laughs> DLL hijacking is a pretty common technique used to inject code into software using dynamic link libraries, hence DLL hijacking. Uh, certain DLLs get loaded into Windows applications when they start. So an attacker can control which DLL a program loads, often by placing them in the program directory folder, then the attacker can inject code into the application, potentially causing a denial of service or other malicious code to run, even elevating privileges to system, potentially. Um, so what can I do about it? To figure this out, we download the ver uh, vulnerable version of the software, as well as the patch, take a look at it. In this case, we've created the classic DLL hijacking technique on the vulnerable software and then validated that the patch works. For the patch, though, we found that though the classic technique was fixed, several other injectable DLLs were still vulnerable. Um, next slide, please. Further investigation led us to some directories that were writable by normal users, which contained several DLLs that execute with system privileges and can be used for privilege escalation. We also found registry keys that normal users could write to, and in a few of these cases, the everyone group had full control. Adding new vulnerabilities to the registry could allow an attacker to change which URL the Connected Components Workbench actually reaches out to get updates from, or it could allow an attacker to point a system level service into loading malicious DLLs. So though they claim that these are fixed in version 10 and 10.1, we were able to talk to them and validate that they were actually fixed in um, version 12 with all of this stuff. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so let's say you patched a version 10 or 10.1 instead of 12. Is there anything else you can do about it? And the answer is, but of course. So you can restrict per permissions to files and registry keys. You can ensure that users with local login privileges do not have admin privileges. You can enable uh, DLL hijacking protection, which you can find on Microsoft's website, uh, by adding the key ccw.shell.exe. And you can also manually update RS links instead of having it call out directly to the internet. Um, next slide, please. So next we talk about prioritization. So is there a loss of view? If compromised, the CCW system could change the basic settings of field devices, including network configuration. This could cause other systems such as OPC servers, HMI servers, and data historians to be unable to communicate with these field devices. In addition, an attacker could change fine tune settings on managed devices that cause a loss of view, which operators may not immediately notice. Loss of control though, the attacker could leverage the system to main, manage um, remote field devices, including changing device network settings, scaling factors, speed of drives, and configuration or logic of the controllers themselves. So this may result in both direct changes of the control outputs, as well as prevent an authorized operator from issuing manual corrections to the process. This give the attacker a full um, ability to access all of the managed devices. But this is still considered just a limited threat because it's a local attack. 
So we would say not to bother necessarily with 10 or 10.1 unless they have the features that you're looking for. But to mitigate the vulnerability, you can install version 12 or just go through the list of um, like DLL hijacking and the other stuff we talked about. Next slide, please. Um, so next we want to look at GE's communicator. So what is it? Um, GE communicator software system is used for configuring and commissioning general electric power meters. It, in this advisory, it says it's vulnerable to a heat-based buffer overflow or a malicious HTML file that loads the ActiveX control can trigger the vulnerability via an unchecked function call. <laughs> what that means is, in order to exploit this issue, an attacker must trick a legitimate user into opening a malicious HTML file, either as a local file or from browsing the internet. Once executed, the attacker may gain access to the power meter configuration with privileges of the logged on user. So let's talk about how we can learn more about that in the next slide. So we download the software, install it, and we run some baseline tools before and after installation to see if any accounts, firewall rules, new services, or registry changes were made. And we open up the software and check NetStat for any other listening services that might have started. Um, and we also check which accounts those listening services are running as. So in this case, both the meter manager schedule software and the Postgres database service are exposed to the network, but are restricted by default because the Windows firewall rules uh, get added on installation and prevent that access. However, if the Windows firewall is accidentally or intentionally disabled, these services are exposed to the network. The services may also be used by a local malicious user um, who already has access to firewalls, not gonna block that, um, to elevate privileges. So on both of these services, we found hard-coded credentials and the meter management service um, was running a system. Next slide, please. But because the firewall rules are created by default to protect the services, we would actually say that this is an attack vector of local instead of ABN. So that would um, be sort of part of its correction. But several new vulnerabilities were identified when we looked at this software. And when working with the vendor to make sure that they are aware, uh, we also, um, but they were, gave us all these CVEs um, reservations. Uh, so some of the things we were able to identify were the installer being vulnerable to DLL hijacking, which prompts the user for user access control, um, potentially also allowing elevation of privileges. But you can read these on your own time. Um, next slide, please. What can you do about it? You can patch version 40517, uh, but if you can't patch, you can still ensure that the firewall is enabled and that no special exceptions are implemented for these services. You can monitor the network for suspicious activity on TCP 1233 or 5433 and enable a network layer for firewall. Um, that way that, you know, even if that one's disabled, at least nobody else can get to it from a remote system. You should also enable DLL hijacking protection, just like the other thing, only adding a registry key for GECOM 40172.exe, which is the installer, and comx.exe, which is the main application. You can also manually change the permissions on the unwise un uninstaller so that authenticated users and users group don't have the ability to modify or write permissions to those files. So how do we prioritize it? If compromised, the communicator system could modify the logic for operating these outputs or could change scaling factors so that protection scheme trips uh, electric power either too soon or too late. This would be an indirect loss and would require additional effort on the part of the attacker to achieve. So we consider this still a limited threat because it's a local attack. Firewalls are in place um, by default. And uh, I would say to patch on the next cycle or mitigate um, using these uh, mitigation techniques. Next slide, please. So first I kind of want to talk about the options or potential paths of course of action that you can take when dealing with vulnerabilities. Uh, so one, you can patch the vulnerability, provided the vendor has a patch for it, and patches could introduce new vulnerabilities, or as we've seen before, not actually mitigate the vulnerability. Second, you can mitigate the vulnerability in some other ways, such as restricting access to the vulnerable comp component or disabling vulnerable services that you aren't using. And lastly, I think this exhausts the list, you can monitor the network and host for exploitation of these vulnerabilities. So let's dig into this a little more. Please, next slide. Um, so I'm <laughs> trying my best not to go on a patching rant, uh, but why do we like patching so much? And I think it's because a lot of us came from IT, myself included, and patching is something that we know, it's something we can work towards, we understand, we can measure our progress, and we can get pretty graphs to show management. Um, and chipping away at a known bad things, it feels good. There's something about that. Uh, but as our, uh, Rob said in his RSA keynote, if you're patching more than 36% of vulnerabilities in OT or ICS environments, you're likely wasting resources. 
I encourage you to patch what you can, what vendors support and what's been known to fix the issue, but in a lot of cases, these devices are insecure by design and fixing the vulnerability doesn't protect you if the device can be controlled remotely, regardless of the vulnerable component. Um, next slide, please. So where have we actually seen vulnerabilities being exploited in IT or OT, or in OT specifically not IT? Um, and why do we care to patch or mitigate? CVE 2015-5374 was a Siemens Ciprotect relay um, denial of service vulnerability exploited by Electrum in the crash override attack. Proof of concept code exists, but when tested in our labs, we found the devices are sent a similar or the same communication when an engineer issues a firmware update command. This just helps us reiterate that accessible features of these devices can be just as disruptive as the vulnerabilities. Um, and they do have a patch, which I haven't looked at, but um, this was the only known patch, um, or I guess known vulnerability before the attack actually happened that we have recorded. Um, and then we have the Schneider Electric Triconics Tricon system, which doesn't have a CVE reserve for it, but you can read their advisory about the vulnerability. This instead was an arbitrary kernel overwrite used to escalate privileges. Executing the program to exploit the vulnerability requires no authentication, but the device in this case was left in program mode. The malware that was deployed has the capability to scan and map industrial control system um, to provide reconnaissance and issue commands to the Tricon controllers. Their recommendation isn't a patch, but instead an equipment <laughs> replacement to the CX version. And lastly, all the rest of the ones in this list um, were targeted HMIs in the Black Energy 2 event in 2014. In this case, there's no evidence the uh, adversary attempted to modify, disrupt, or otherwise impact operations, but instead focused on information collection and enumeration only. But these devices were able to route directly to the internet and called out to command and control servers. So given that uh, adversaries have been able to play in this space and only one of which utilizing an already known vulnerability, I think it's important to note that attackers will always follow the path of least resistance. So the vast majority of activity that we see today is from living off the land instead of from exploiting vulnerabilities. Um, next slide, please. I'd encourage instead of focusing on patching, but focus on what an attacker can do and what they can get from wherever they are. So you should only be able to get to OT through jump boxes. Controllers should only be modified from HMI or engineering workstations. You can make sure you restrict down access to only the stuff that makes sense for the function of each device and segment properly. You should always run scenarios and test assumptions on how your network is designed and where it should route to. Next slide, please. So for prioritizing known vulnerabilities inside your environment, first ask yourself, is the vulnerability actively being exploited? Is the proof of concept easily weaponizable? Is there a loss of view or loss of control impact to the process? And can it be exploited remotely? So at what point are you wasting your resources? If you've already segmented your network so that you know, only things that are necessary can communicate to each other, if you've trained employees about malicious software or project files, if you've identified choke points in and routes outbound and are monitoring for exploitation on the wire, vulnerabilities associated with these are almost already taken care of. Uh, if you wanna take it to the next level, understand and monitor from like a host level potential malicious, uh, malicious project files that could um, get into the hands of engineers, basically. Next slide, please. And for everything else, there's monitoring. It's important to know when reconnaissance is being done in your industrial control network. And it's important to, that the tools that you have understand OT specific functionality and design. Monitoring when done correctly can help your team understand the environment that they're protecting, which I think is key for combating any threats. It's also important that you capture the right information through effectively placed tabs. Visibility gives us insight into our process and a closer look into an adversary behavior. The catching, the chasing vulnerabilities just doesn't seem to solve that problem. Next slide, please. Uh, so what I ask is for vendors and ICS cert to please include additional mitigation steps beyond patch information. Not everybody has the time or resources to do this sort of investigation. So um, we ask the vendors provide additional details um, for those who just can't patch. Uh, next slide, please. And um, yeah, cool. That's it. If you have any questions, please ask the Q&A. And my contact information is there as well. If anybody has any you know, stories from the trenches, if you have them, um, just send them to me directly. I appreciate that. Thank you very much.